Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar A.S. Karmi. The news articles along with the page numbers are displayed here for your reference. The PDF link of the handwritten notes and the time stamping of the news articles is given in the description box as well as in the comment section. Now let us start our today's news analysis. This news article discusses about the important weapons and weapon systems that are showcased during the 71st Republic Day Parade. That is on 26th January 2020. See some of the important showcased weapons are the anti-satellite missile, air defense tactical control radar, Chinook heavy lift helicopters and the Apache attack helicopters. See we have discussed about the Chinook heavy lift helicopters and Apache attack helicopters in our 14th January Hindu news analysis. So you can watch this video for your better understanding. In today's analysis, we will be seeing about anti-satellite missile and the air defense tactical control radar. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. Now we will see about anti-satellite system that is as the name suggests they are against a incoming satellites. That is these are space weapons that are designated to destroy satellites for strategic military purposes. These anti-satellite missiles are of two types, one is kinetic anti-satellite and the other type is non-kinetic anti-satellite. So, in case of kinetic anti-satellite, these satellites strike physically an object and destroy like a ballistic missile. On the other hand, a non-kinetic anti-satellite uses non-physical means that is use of uh, frequency jamming to destroy or disable a space object. Now we will see the uses of anti-satellite systems that is it can intercept and can jam the communication satellites or military satellites of enemy countries. Then these satellites can access critical information about troop movements or incoming missiles. These satellites can also launch cyber attacks on space systems and also can direct laser based weapons. Therefore these are some of the uses of anti-satellites. Now you should know that India has successfully test fired an anti-satellite missile that is in March 2019. This anti-satellite test is named as Mission Shakti. Therefore under this test the anti-satellite missile shot down a live satellite in the low earth orbit. Know that this satellite which is used in the mission was one of the India's existing satellites that was operating in the low earth orbit. And this satellite was a DRDO designated satellite. It has been specially launched by the Indian Space Research Organization two months earlier for the anti-satellite missile test. So our mission targeted the Indian satellite which was launched for this purpose only. Know that this mission Shakti was led by the Defense Research and Development Organization that is DRDO and this mission is aimed at strengthening India's overall security capacity. This mission Shakti is an indigenous development of the anti-satellite technology. So the mission Shakti and the anti-satellite technology are pride for our country. That is why it was showcased during the Republic Day Parade. Now let us see some of the important features of mission Shakti. See the anti-satellite missile test was conducted from the APC Abdul Kalam Island in the state of Odisha. The anti-satellite missile is a DRDO developed ballistic missile defense interceptor missile that is BMD interceptor missile which was successfully hit and destroyed an Indian orbiting target satellite in the low earth orbit. This missile is a 13 meter high three stage interceptor missile. The missile was fitted with two solid propellant rocket motor stages and the BMD interceptor missile was engaged in a hit to kill mode. So it is a kill vehicle. They know that the missile hit this satellite with a 10 centimeters accuracy. So it is important to note that though the target Indian satellite of the March 27th test was hit at a range of 283 kilometers but the missile is actually capable of shooting down objects that are moving at 10 kilometers per second at a far higher altitude of nearly 200 kilometers. Now we will see the significance of mission Shakti. See the test has demonstrated the nation's capability to defend its assets in the outer space as the test required an extremely high degree of precision and technical capability. So by attaining all that the test was fully successful and it has achieved all the pre-designed parameters. Therefore the test was a vindication of the strength and robust nature of DRDO's programs. 
The significance of the test is that India has tested and successfully demonstrated its capability to intercept and destroy a satellite in outer space based on indigenous technology. So the test has once again proven the capability of indigenous weapon system of our country. Now with this test India has joined a select group of nations which have anti-satellite missile technology. So India became the fourth country in the world to develop an anti-satellite capability after USA, Russia and China. This is all about the significance of anti-satellite missile test that is Mission Shikti. Now we will see the disadvantages or challenges of any anti-satellite mission. One of the major disadvantages of any ASAT missions is that it creates debris in the space. That is the destroyed satellites would disintegrate into several smaller objects and they will be added to a large amount of debris in the outer space. And this space debris is considered as a threat to functional satellites and also other space assets. Even India was criticized by other nations for carrying out the test and creating debris in the space. But India denied such allegations because the test was done in the lower atmosphere to ensure that there is no space debris. And whatever debris that was generated by the test, it will decay and it will fall back onto the earth within the weeks. So according to Indian government, there is no problem of space debris in our anti-satellite missile test that is Mission Shakti. Then the next question is that whether India violated any international law or treaty. See, the principal international treaty on space is the 1967 Outer Space Treaty. Know that India is a signatory to this treaty and India also ratified the treaty in 1982. The Outer Space Treaty prohibits only weapons of mass destruction in outer space, but it does not prohibit any ordinary weapons. So India is not in violation of any international law or treaty to which India is a party or to which India has any national obligation. This is all about anti-satellite missile test that is Mission Shikti. Now let us see about the Air Defense Tactical Control Radar that is ADTCR. It is developed for Army Air Defense in the country. That is the Air Defense Tactical Control Radar is mainly used for surveillance in the country. It is used for detection, tracking or identification of aerial targets of different types. It is also used for transmission of prioritized target data to multiple command posts or weapon systems in the country. Know that the radar is capable of detecting very small targets and low flying targets. The radar system is configured on two high mobility vehicles and it can be transportable by roadways, railways, including airways. The system that is radar system is modular in construction which means that the factory produced pre-engineered building units which can be delivered to site and they can be easily assembled. The modular construction makes it easy for installation, operation and maintenance of the radar system. See the radar system can be deployed in plain terrains, deserts and also in the mountain regions for the purpose of tactical early warning of ground based weapon systems for the effective defense of the borders. Therefore the system is designed for survivability in intense environmental conditions and the operations cabin is protected against nuclear, biological and chemical weapons. So the ADTs here gives a true air picture with precise target parameters including the target range, height and speed etc of the targets. So in the context of 71st Republic Day Parade, we have discussed the important weapons and weapon systems that are showcased during the parade. With this we have come to the end of analysis of this news article. The displayed practice question will be discussed at the end of the session. Now let us proceed to the next news article analysis. This news article talks about the Andhra Pradesh cabinet's decision to abolish the legislative council of the state. So in this context we will be seeing what is the procedure to create or abolish legislative council, then the number of states which are having legislative council, then the merits and demerits of having the legislative council in the state legislature. 
The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. See, the Andhra Pradesh cabinet which met today has taken the decision to abolish the Legislative Council. And the decision to abolish the Legislative Council was taken after the Andhra Pradesh Legislative Council referred two important government's bill to a select committee for further deliberation. These bills are the Andhra Pradesh Capital Region Development Authority Repeal Bill 2020 and the AP Decentralization and Inclusive Development of All Reasons Bill of 2020. The AP Decentralization Bill aims to give shape to the ruling government's plan of having three capitals for the state. That is, executive capital will be in Vishakapatnam, then the legislative capital will be in the Amravati city, then the judicial capital will be in Karnal. These bills were passed in the state legislative assembly where the ruling party has a majority that is 151 seats out of 175 but the bills were referred to a select committee by the chairman of the legislative council where the opposition party has a majority that is 27 out of 58 seats. Now, the state legislature, which occupies a central position in the political system of a state, is constituted as per the provisions of the constitution. That is, Article 168 to 202 of the Indian constitution deals with the organization, composition, duration, procedure, etc. of the state legislature. However, all the states don't have a uniformity in the organization of the state legislatures. See, most of the states have a unicameral system while others have a bicameral system. Here, unicameral means having only one house whereas bicameral system means having two houses that is legislative council for the state legislature. See, at present only six states have two houses in the state legislatures. These states are the state of Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Maharashtra and Karnataka. Know that after bifurcation of the state of Jammu and Kashmir into two union territories that is union territory of Jammu and Kashmir and union territory of Ladakh, the then state of Jammu and Kashmir had a state legislative council. But after bifurcation of the state, now the Jammu and Kashmir union territory is not having the legislative council. Therefore, at present only six states are having bicameral system of state legislature. See, the constitution provides for the creation or abolition of legislative councils in the state. Article 169 provides for such creation or abolition of the state legislative councils in the states. Therefore, the parliament can abolish a legislative council where it already exists and create the legislative council where it does not exist. The parliament can create or abolish the legislative council if the legislative assembly of the concerned state passes a resolution to that effect. And such resolution must be passed by the legislative assembly with a special majority. If the special majority refers to a majority of the total membership of the assembly and a majority of not less than two thirds of the members present and voting. After the resolution is passed by the state legislative assembly, it is sent to the parliament. That is, as per Article 169 of the Constitution of India, Parliament may by law provide for the abolition of the Legislative Council of a state having such a Legislative Council or for the creation of such a Legislative Council in a state having no such Council if the State Legislative Assembly of the state passes a resolution to that effect. If the Parliament may or may not pass the bill in order to give effect to the resolution which is passed by the State Legislative Assembly. Here the bill requires only simple majority in case of parliament whereas special majority for state legislative assembly. Now we will see the composition of the council that is the size of the council depends on the size of the legislative assembly. Here the minimum strength is fixed at 40 and the maximum strength is fixed at one third of the total strength of the legislative assembly. Here the provision for abolition or creation of legislative council was made to enable a state to have a second chamber or not according to its own willingness and financial strength. But the idea of having a second chamber has been criticized on the grounds that it is not a representative of the people and it delays the legislative process and it is an expensive institution. To the maximum, as a revising body, it can delay an ordinary bill for a maximum period of 4 months in total and in case of money bills, it can delay for 14 days only. See, the council consists of differently elected members and nominated members. 
and this heterogeneous composition makes its position weak and it also reduces its utility. See some critics pointed out that the Legislative Council serves as a refugee for those who are defeated in the Legislative Assembly elections. On the other hand, its utility has been supported mainly on the grounds that it checks the hasty, defective, careless and ill-considered legislation made by the Legislative Assembly because it provides a provision for revision and rethought by the members of Legislative Council. Then the Legislative Council also facilitates the representation of eminent professionals then experts who cannot face direct elections in the Legislative Assembly. Know that one-sixth of the members of Legislative Council are appointed through the Governor's nomination. Therefore, to conclude this news article, we have discussed the procedure for creation or abolition of Legislative Council, then the number of states which are having the Legislative Council, then the merits and demerits of having the Legislative Council in the state legislature. The displayed practice question will be discussed at the end of the session. Now, let us proceed to the next news article analysis. Now, let us see these editorials which are related to the Constitution of India. So, in this context, we will be discussing about some of the salient features of Indian Constitution. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of these editorials is highlighted here for your reference. See, a lot of news articles and editorials have appeared today as India celebrated its 71st Republic Day on 26th January 2020. So, in this context, let us see in brief how the Constitution of India came into existence. For the purpose of framing Indian constitution, that is in 1946, the Constituent Assembly was constituted. This Constituent Assembly appointed a number of committees in order to deal with different tasks of constitution making. One of the committees was the drafting committee, which was given the task of preparing the draft of Indian constitution. Then after considering the proposals of other committees, the then drafting committee prepared the final draft of Constitution of India, which was introduced in Constituent Assembly. See, the Constituent Assembly adapted the Constitution of India on 26th November 1949. The original constitution that is which was adapted on 26th November 1949 contained a preamble and about 395 articles and 8 schedules. Know that the preamble was enacted after the entire constitution was enacted. So we can see that the constitution of India is a lengthy one. In fact, it is the lengthiest written constitution of the world. And various provisions of Indian constitution were drawn from different sources across the world. So, this is one of the salient features of Indian constitution that is the sources of Indian constitution also drawn from other constitutions of the world. Here one thing which you need to know is that some provisions of the constitution that is with reference to elections, citizenship etc. came into enforcement on the 26th November 1949 itself. Then the remaining provisions which form the major part of the constitution came into enforcement on 26th January 1950. This day is being celebrated as the Republic Day. This is why you can see more news articles and editorials which are related to the Indian constitution. In today's analysis, let us see three editorials that are related to Indian constitution. Here two editorials discuss about the preamble and the other editorial discusses about the role of judiciary in the interpretation of Indian constitution. Now let us see the editorials that discusses about preamble. Here the text of the preamble is given here for your reference. But know that the original constitution when it was adapted did not have the words such as socialist, secular and integrity. And all these three terms were included by the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act of 1976. Now let us look at this first editorial which is titled as at the art of the republic. See this editorial is more of political in nature but what we need to focus here is that the author has said about preamble. The author tells that the center of India's constitution is the preamble. Here the author has quoted from the preamble that liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship. Here the term liberty means the absence of restraint on individuals and at the same time providing opportunities for the development of individual personalities. So the preamble secures the liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship through the fundamental rights which are mentioned in part 3 of Indian constitution. See here the term liberty means literally to do what we like. 
but is it possible for us as an individual to have liberty to do anything that we like for this question the answer is no because there are certain limitations and these limitations are mentioned in the indian constitution itself so we can also tell that the liberty which every individual enjoys through the fundamental rights is not absolute fundamental right because there are certain limitations for this fundamental right so in this editorial the author tells that liberty is faring well in india though the liberty of some individuals are restricted and the media then the bureaucracy and the judiciary is all cautious in the present scenario he tells that the young people of india especially the students and the youth are peacefully protesting across india against the recently enacted citizenship amendment act this shows that the individuals still have the liberty to thought expression and belief the author concludes by telling that if the democratic spirit of the people of india is strong and if it stays non violent then it would definitely make a difference here it means that the government might change its mindset because of the actions or the protests of the young people now let us see this editorial in opet column which again discusses on preamble The author of this editorial tells that now the preamble is being read out in all the protests across India. He the author tells that such acts are trying to emphasize the fact that the soul of India's constitution is the preamble. He the author has discussed how the original preamble evolved. That is when Ambedkar the then chairman of drafting committee moved the draft constitution in the constituent assembly the preamble contained the terms that is we the people of india who had resolved to constitute india into a sovereign democratic republic here ambedkar told that these terms in the preamble try to convey that the constitution of india derives its root authority and sovereignty from the people of this country This is the reason why the word democratic was included. Here the democratic means people possess the power. Know that there are two types of democracy that is direct form of democracy and indirect form of democracy. In India it is indirect democracy that is the people elect their representatives and these representatives exercises the power on behalf of the people. They govern the people and also they make laws for the progress of the country. This is called as representative democracy. So this is how people exercises their power and in India we have parliamentary representative democracy which is another feature of Indian constitution. Some of the examples to show that democratic polity exists in India are universal adult franchise, periodic elections, rule of law, then independence of judiciary etc. and all these are some more salient features of Indian constitution. So far we have discussed two editorials which were related to preamble. The first editorial discussed about the spirit of the word liberty and the second editorial discussed about the spirit of democracy. Now let us see the third editorial which discusses about the role of Indian judiciary in interpreting the Indian constitution. Before seeing this editorial you need to know one more salient feature of Indian constitution that is Indian constitution is blend of rigidity and flexibility. This is because some provisions of Indian constitution need special processes to be amended whereas at the same time certain provisions can be amended in the same way how the ordinary laws are made. So you can see that the Indian constitution is blend of rigidity and flexibility. Now if you see the union legislature that is the parliament has a greater role in amending the constitution under article 368 now a question may arise that if the provisions of the indian constitution may be changed as per the desire of the indian parliament but we have necessary checks and balances to strike a balance between parliament sovereignty and the supremacy of the judiciary So in order to uphold this balance we have an independent and an integrated judiciary in this country. If the Supreme Court is at the top most of this integrated judicial system it is the highest court of appeal and it is the guardian of Indian constitution. So independent and an integrated judiciary is also another feature of Indian constitution. So in this context let us see this editorial which discusses how judiciary has evolved over the past 70 years in interpreting India's constitution. He the author has classified into four phases that is the first phase is known as text based approach in the first phase the supreme court interpreted the constitution text by text literally 
Then in second phase which is known as structure based approach the author tells that the Supreme Court began to interpret in another way that is if any appeals were made in the court against any particular text of Indian constitution then the Supreme Court started interpreting the overall structure and logic of constitution in reference to the appeals made in the court of law. Now what happened in the third phase which was also known as eclecticism based approach. Here eclecticism is an approach that derives idea from variety of sources instead of a single source. Here the interpretation is based on different sources but keeping the constitutional provisions of India at the center. Now let us look at the fourth phase in which the author tells that India is currently transitioning from third phase to fourth phase. So in fourth phase the Supreme Court has started to acknowledge the fact that the purpose for which the constitution had been framed needs to be considered during its interpretation. The author welcomes this fourth phase of judiciary because it recognizes the revolutionary and transformative potential of the Indian constitution. So to justify this fourth phase of judiciary the author mentions that uh, some of the examples which include the recent judgment of Supreme Court in which the court has struck down some of the provisions of section 377 and the judgment which made the office of chief justice of India under the ambit of RTA act etc. So the author tells that India is going in the right direction where the Supreme Court interprets the purpose of the constitution. However, he tells that phase 3 still exists because some important cases that are concerning the national register of citizens and the electoral bond scheme are still interpreted by smaller pinches. So the author cautions that the Supreme Court should not move back to the third phase. Instead, it should actively interpret the purpose of the constitution. So we can see from this editorial how judiciary has evolved over the past 70 years in interpreting the Indian constitution. So this is all about the discussion of these three editorials. So to summarize we have seen three editorials that are related to Indian constitution. Two editorials discuss about the preamble and the democracy and one editorial discusses about the role of judiciary in interpreting India's constitution since India became a republic. So throughout our discussion we also saw the silent features of Indian constitution. It is compiled here for your easy reference. With this we have come to the end of analysis of these editorials. The display practice question will be discussed at the end of the session. Now let us proceed to the next news article analysis. This discussion is about the Padma Awards. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this news article is highlighted here for your reference. The news article mentions that former Nagaland Chief Minister S.C. Jame and the People's Democratic Party leader Mujafar Baig have been finalized as the awardees for Padma Bhushan. See this year the president has approved conferment of 141 Padma Awards. So in this contest we will be analyzing this news article in the exam point of view. The Padma Awards are one of the highest civilian honors of India and it is announced annually on the eve of Republic Day. See initially if you see in 1954 the government of India instituted two civilian awards that is Bharat Ratna and Padma Vibhushan. In this that is the Padma Vibhushan had three classes these are Pehla Varg, Dusra Varg and Tisra Varg. But in 1955 these three classes again renamed as Padma Vibhushan, Padma Bhushan and Padma Sri through a presidential notification. So currently the Padma Awards are given in three categories that is first category is known as Padma Vibhushan. This decoration is awarded for exceptional and distinguished service in any field including the service rendered by government servants. Then the next category is Padma Bhushan. This decoration is awarded for distinguished service of higher order in any field including the service rendered by government servants. Then the third category is known as Padma Sri. This decoration is awarded for distinguished service in any field including the service rendered by government servants. So the Padma award seeks to recognize achievements in all fields of activities or disciplines where an element of public service is involved. So the Padma awards are conferred on the recommendations made by the Padma awards committee. This Padma Awards Committee is constituted by the Prime Minister every year and it is headed by the Cabinet Secretary and it also includes Home Secretary, 
then secretary to the president and four to six eminent persons as its members then the committee recommends list of the names for the approval also know that the nomination process is open to the public and uh, even self nomination can be made for these awards then one important point to note here is that normally the padma award is not conferred posthumously posthumously means awarded to the person after the death of the person however in highly deserving cases the government could consider giving an award posthumously see the awards are presented by the president of india usually in the month of march or april every year where the awardees are presented a sanad or certificate which is signed by the president and they are also presented a medallion most important point that you should remember from examination point of view is that the award does not amount to a title and it cannot be used as a suffix or prefix to the awardee's name this point is very important because the article 18 of indian constitution abolishes titles here the hereditary titles of nobility like maharaja raj bahadur rai bahadur roy saheb diwan etc which were conferred by colonial states or banned by article 18 it is because these titles are against the principle of equal status of all now you may think that the padma awards is also awarded to selected number of people then is it not against the principle of equal status to all see in 1996 the supreme court ruled that these awards do not amount to titles within the meaning of article 18 that is which prohibits only hereditary titles of nobility then the supreme court upheld the constitutional validity of national awards namely bharat ratna padma vibhushan padma bhushan and padma shri therefore these awards are not violate of article 18 because the theory of equality does not mandate that merit should not be recognized and these awards were given based on the merit but not on hereditary that is why these awards are constitutional but supreme court also ruled that these awards should not be used as suffixes or prefixes to the names of awardees if they do so then the awardees should forfeit or surrender the awards so a person can be awarded with the high category of padma awards later stage also if it has been conferred then there is an order in which the medals and decorations have to be worn see this order is called the order of precedence of various medals and decorations and this order is notified by president of india for various medals and decorations and as you can see padma awards are in the top 10 the highest civilian award of bharat ratna as precedence over the param veer chakra which is the india's highest military decoration so in the context of this news article that the president has approved conferment of 141 padma awards we have discussed in detail about padma awards With this we have come to the end of analysis of this news article the display practice question will be discussed at the end of the session now let us proceed to the next news article analysis this article talks about the middle east peace plan which will be likely to be released by the us administration next week and the palestinians reaction to such an announcement the syllabus which is relevant to the analysis of this news article is given here for your reference see us president donald trump will likely unveil his middle east peace plan next week as a result the palestinian leaders threaten to withdraw from key provisions of the oslo accord the palestinian negotiator eric cat even told that trump is repeatedly backing israel and its demands So Washington's historic role as mediator in Israel-Palestine conflict is no longer recognized. He also added that Trump's initiative will turn Israel's temporary occupation of Palestinian territory into a permanent occupation, and it is against the spirit of two-state solution of Oslo Accord. If such plan would be released by the US, then the Palestine Liberation Organization, that is PLO, had the right to withdraw from the interim agreement of the Oslo Accord. So, in this context, we shall be seeing what is Oslo Accord, then what is two-state solution, then a brief history of Israel-Palestine conflict, and what is the recent Middle East peace plan, which is going to be released by US administration. So to understand Oslo Accord we shall first look into the reasons why such accord was made in the first place So if we see that this Oslo Accord was signed between Israel government and Palestinian Liberation Organization in 1993 
and it defines certain arrangements of Palestine with Israel in order to resolve the long standing Palestine Israel conflict. So, what is the Palestine Israel conflict? To understand the issue that is in detail, first you should know about the geographical borders of Israel and Palestine. Here you can see the territories of West Bank and Gaza Strip. These two territories in which the Palestinians are in majority were occupied by Israel since 1967 and it is the heart of the 70 year Israel Palestine conflict. See the West Bank is located to the west of Jordan River. It is a landlocked territory and the West Bank is bordered by Jordan and Israel. Then the Gaza Strip as you can see in the map is a small boot shaped territory along the Mediterranean coast between Egypt and Israel. If you go back in time that is after World War I which ended in 1918 both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip became part of British mandated Palestine. But by the end of World War II, that is in 1945, the Jews demanded a homeland within Palestine to settle. So, in 1948, Jewish paramilitary groups formed the state of Israel by force. Thereon, Israel started expanding its territory and after 1967 six-day war, Israel captured West Bank, Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem. So, in this picture, you can see how Israel expanded its territory and dispossessed Palestinians from 1946 to present times. So, we can say that a large part of Palestinian population has been living under Israel-occupied territories in both the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. So, to pacify Palestinian population under Israel control, in 1993, Oslo Accord was signed. So, under this Oslo Accord, two-state solution was proposed. That is, the two-state solution is simply a framework which proposes Israel for the Jewish people and Palestine for the Palestinians. So, as per Oslo Accord, part of West Bank came under Palestinian territory that is at present about 40% of West Bank is under Palestine control and about 60% is under Israel control. You should know that as per Oslo Accord, Israel recognized the Palestine Liberation Organization that is PLO as a representative of the Palestine people and also as a party to the peace negotiations between Israel and Palestine. So, in turn, the PLO officially recognized Israel's right to exist peacefully with Palestine and renounced the use of violence against Palestinians to achieve its goals. So, to bring effect of Oslo Accord, in 1995, the Israel-Palestinian Interim Agreement was signed, which is also known as Oslo II Accord. See, presently, both Israel and Palestinian Authority have staked claim over Jerusalem as their capital city. The Palestinians want Israel to fully withdraw from the occupied West Bank, Gaza Strip and East Jerusalem. But the UN and most of the international community have broadly rejected both the claims. They supported that the matter should be resolved through peaceful negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians. See, previous US administrations also agreed and followed the framework of two-state solution in dealing with Israel-Palestine conflict. But over the past three years, the Trump administration has controversially recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital. It also relocated the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Apart from this, the U.S. government has also announced that it no longer views Israeli settlements in occupied territory as inconsistent with international law. So, the U.S. has also stopped funding to Palestinian refugees. Then adding fuel to the fire, the Trump administration will be likely to release Middle East peace plan targeting Palestinians. See the economic component of the peace plan was released in June 2019 and it calls for about 50 billion dollars in international investment in the Palestinian territories and neighboring countries for a period of next 10 years. Therefore, as a reaction to the Trump plan, the Palestinians rejected Trump's plan blaming that the fundamental political issues such as occupation of Palestinian territories, rights of refugees and border sovereignty were not at all mentioned in the plan. So, in the context of this news article that is Middle East peace plan which is going to be announced by US administration, we have discussed the geographical borders of Israel and Palestine, then the historical conflict of Israel and Palestine, then about Oslo Accord. With this we have come to the end of analysis of this news article. The displayed practice question will be discussed at the end of the session. Now, let us start our practice question session. Now, let us take up this question. 
with reference to mission sikti they have given two statements and you have to choose correct statements statement one says that other than usa russia and japan india is the only country to have asat capability then second statement says that the asat missile was a drdo developed ballistic missile defense that is bmd interceptor missile that targeted the satellite in low earth orbit see this question is based on mission shakti which aims to test anti satellite destroying capability see the test was conducted from the apj abdul kalam island in the state of odisha and the asat missile is a drdo developed ballistic missile defense that is bmd interceptor missile which was successfully hit and destroyed an indian orbiting target satellite in the low earth orbit see this missile is a 13 meter high three stage interceptor missile which is fitted with two solid propellant rocket motor stages see the interceptor missile was engaged in a hit to kill mode so it is a kill vehicle and the missile hit the satellite with 10 cm accuracy so the significance of asat missile test is that it has demonstrated the nation's capability to defend its assets in outer space and the test required an extremely high degree of precision and technical capability So by attaining all these parameters the test was fully successful and it has achieved all the pre-designed parameters see the significance of the test is that india has tested and successfully demonstrated its capacity to intercept and destroy a satellite in outer space the two based on indigenous technology so the test has once again proven the capability of indigenous weapon systems of our country so with this test india joined a select group of nations which have such asat capability so india became the fourth nation in the world to develop an asat capability after usa russia and china so if you look at the first statement it has mentioned usa russia japan so the given first statement is incorrect whereas the second statement is correct statement because the asat missile was a drdo developed ballistic missile defense interceptor missile that targeted the satellite in low earth orbit so for this question option b 2 only is the correct option now look at this question that is a defense tactical control radar sometimes seen in the news they have given four options and you have to choose correct option option a says that it is an israel radar system then the second option says india's indigenous radar for army a defense then option c says an american anti missile system then option d says an anti missile system manufactured by the defense collaboration between japan and south korea See for this question option B that is it is a India's indigenous radar for army a defense is the correct answer See the A defense tactical control radar is used mainly for surveillance that is it is used for detection tracking or identification of aerial targets of different types See it is also used for transmission of prioritized target data to multiple command post or weapon systems The radar is capable of detecting very small objects including low flying targets see the radar system is configured on two high mobility vehicles and it can be transportable by rail by roadways including airways see the system is modular in construction which means that the factory produced pre designed or pre engineered building units which can be easily delivered to the target site and can be easily assembled see the modular construction makes it easy for installation operation and maintenance therefore the a defense tactical control radar gives a true air picture with precise target parameters including the target range speed of the targets so it is a surveillance system mainly developed for army a defense in the country so for this question option b is the correct answer now let's take up this question which is based on padma awards they have given four statements and you have to choose incorrect statements statement one says that it is the highest civilian award of the country then the second statement says that the padma vibhushan teesra work was renamed as padma sri in 1955 then third statement says that it is conferred on the recommendations of padma awards committee which is headed by the prime minister then the fourth statement says that the award does not amount to a title and cannot be used as a suffix or prefix to the awardee's name 
See the first statement is incorrect because Bharat Ratna is the highest civilian award of the country. It is awarded in recognition of exceptional service or performance of the highest order in any field of human endeavor. See it is treated on a different footing from Padma Awards whereas the Padma Awards are one of the highest civilian honors of India which are announced annually on the eve of Republic Day. Now, if you look at the second statement, which says that the Padma Vibhushan Tristra work was renamed as Padma Sri in 1955. See, this statement is correct statement because in 1954, the government of India instituted two civilian awards, that is Bharat Ratna and Padma Vibhushan. See, in this Padma Vibhushan, it had three classes, namely Pehle work, Dusra work and Tisra work. But in 1955, these three classes are again renamed as Padma Vibhushan, Padma Bhushan and Padma Sri through a presidential notification. So, at present, the Padma Awards are given in three categories. The first category is known as Padma Vibhushan and this decoration is awarded for exceptional and distinguished service in any field including the service rendered by government servants. Then the next category is known as Padma Bhushan and this decoration is awarded for distinguished service of higher order in any field including the service rendered by government servants. Then the third category is known as Padma Sri and this decoration is awarded for distinguished service in any field including the service rendered by government servants. So the Padma Awards seeks to recognize achievements in all fields of achievements or disciplines where an element of public service is involved. See the Padma Awards are conferred on the recommendations made by the Padma Awards Committee and this Padma Awards Committee is constituted by the Prime Minister every year and the Padma Awards Committee is headed by the Cabinet Secretary and it also includes Home Secretary, then Secretary to the President and four to six eminent persons as its members. Then the Padma Awards Committee recommends the list of names to be awarded by the President of India. See, this committee is not headed by the Prime Minister of India, but it is constituted by the Prime Minister. So, we can say that the given statement, that is second statement is correct statement, whereas third statement is incorrect statement. Now, if you look at the fourth statement, it says that the award does not amount to a title and cannot be used as a suffix or prefix to the awardee's name. See, this statement is also correct statement because in 1996, the Supreme Court ruled that the Padma Awards do not amount to titles within the meaning of Article 18, which prohibits only hereditary titles of nobility. See, the Supreme Court upheld the constitutional validity of the national awards, namely Bharat Ratna, Padma Vibhushan, Padma Bhushan and Padma Sri. Therefore, these awards are not violative of Article 18 because the theory of equality does not mandate the merit should not be recognized. See, these awards are given based on the merit but not on hereditary basis. That is why these awards are constitutionally valid. However, the Supreme Court also ruled that these awards should not be used as suffixes or prefixes to the names of awardees. And if they do so, then the awardees should forfeit or surrender the awards. So, for this question, they are asking which of the given statements are incorrect. So, we have seen that first and third statements are incorrect, whereas second and fourth statements are correct statements. So, for this question, option C, that is 1 and 3, is the correct answer for this question. Now, let us take up this question which was asked in 2017 UPSC prelims examination. The question says that which one of the following objectives is not embodied in the preamble to the constitution of India? They have given four options that is option A says that liberty of thought, then economic liberty, then liberty of expression, then liberty of belief. See this question was asked in 2017 UPSC prelims. The question is based on the text of preamble which secures that is to all citizens of India the liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship. See, all these liberties are secured through the fundamental rights which are included in the part 3 of the Indian constitution. You should know that the ideals of liberty, equality, fraternity which are mentioned in our preamble have been taken from the French revolution. So, for this question, they are asking that which of the following objectives is not embodied in the preamble. So, for this question, option B that is economic liberty is the correct answer. 
Now let us take up this question. They have given two statements and you have to choose incorrect statements. Statement 1 says that the preamble to the Indian constitution has been amended several times since India became a republic. Then the second statement says that 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act of 1976 inserted secular and democratic in the preamble. Now, if you look at the first statement, it tells that the preamble to the Indian constitution has been amended several times since India became a republic. So, in this context, you should know that India became a republic on 26th January 1950. Since then, the preamble has been amended only once that is in 1976 by the 42nd Constitutional Amendment Act of 1976. Therefore, the given first statement is incorrect statement. So, by this amendment, it included three terms that is socialist, secular and integrity. So, the original preamble which consisted sovereign democratic republic now became sovereign socialist secular democratic and republic after the amendment and the unity of nation became unity and integrity of the nation. So, it is not the words secular and democratic but the words socialist and secular. Here you can eliminate the second statement in another way also that is the Indian constitution envisaged democracy that is the participation of the people since it was adapted. See in India it is indirect democracy where the people elect their representatives and these representatives exercise the power on behalf of the people. So they govern the people and also they make laws for the governance. So this is known as representative form of democracy. Therefore, by this logic, you can eliminate second statement as an incorrect statement. So, for this question, option C that is both 1 and 2 is the correct answer for this question. Now, let us take up this question that is Oslo Accord recently news is related to. See, for this question, they have given four options that is option A says prevention of marine pollution by dumping from ships and aircrafts. Then option B says withdrawal of Britain from the European Union. Then C says Israel-Palestine conflict whereas option D says control of transboundary movements of hazardous waste and their disposal. See, this question is based on Oslo Accord which was signed in 1993 and it deals with Israel-Palestine conflict. So, as per the Accord, it proposes two-state solution that is Israel for Jews and Palestine for Palestinian people. So, for this question, option C is the correct answer. So, in the context of this question, you should also know that there is Oslo Convention which deals with the prevention of marine pollution by dumping from ships and aircrafts and Basel Convention which deals with control of transboundary movements of hazardous waste and their disposal. The withdrawal of Britain from the European Union can be seen in the context of Brexit. So, for this question option C that is Israel-Palestine conflict is the correct answer. Now, this question says that the term two-state solution is sometimes mentioned in the news is in the context of the office of. This question was asked in 2018 UPSC prelims examination. They have given four options that is China, Israel, Iraq and Yemen. See the two state solution proposes one state for Jews and another state for Palestinian people. See this two state solution was result of Oslo Accord which was signed in 1993. So for this question option B that is Israel is the correct answer. So in this context try to know that one nation two systems which is often in the news is related to China and the Hong Kong. Now let us take up this question which was asked in 2015 UPSC prelims examination. They have given two statements and you have to choose correct statements. Statement 1 says that the legislative council of a state in India can be larger in size than half of the legislative assembly of that particular state. Whereas second statement says that the governor of a state nominates the chairman of legislative council of that particular state. So, in the context of this question, you should know about legislative councils. See, the size of the legislative council depends on the size of the legislative assembly. The minimum strength is fixed at 40, whereas maximum strength is fixed at one third of the total strength of the assembly. Therefore, the given first statement is incorrect statement. See, the chairman of legislative council is elected by the council itself from among its members. So, the given second statement is also incorrect statement. For this question, they are asking that which of the given statements are correct. Therefore, option D, neither 1 nor 2 is the correct answer. 
Now, let us take up mains questions. This question was asked in 2018 mains examination in GS1 paper. The question says that why is Indian Regional Navigational Satellite System that is IRNSS is needed? How does it help in navigation? This question is a 10 marks question and you have to write in 150 words. So, on a similar note, let us take up this practice question which can be asked in GS3 paper. The question says that an ASAT mission creates space debris which is a threat to functional satellites and other space assets. In the light of the above statement, discuss the features and advantages of mission Shakti. This is a 10 marks question and you can write in 150 words. So, for these two main questions, you can post your written answers in the comment section. Your posted answers would be evaluated and suitable feedback will be given in the reasonable time frame. With this, we have come to the end of analysis of today's Hindu news analysis. If you like the video, please do like, share, comment and subscribe Shankar IS Academy YouTube channel for daily updates. Thank you.